Okay, so let's continue this talk. Um, just just a, a precision on what I, I just told because I had a, a question from uh, uh, some people uh, in the room uh, during the pause. What happens, basically the question was the following, what happens if two threads are modifying uh, the array at the same time? Well, first, it's not supposed to happen because this pattern works well when there are many reads and a few, only a few writes. So if you have concurrent writes on it, you're borderline in the use case of, uh, of this pattern, the copy and write arrays. Now, if it happens anyway, uh, suppose the thread C T2 become, uh, begins to, to copy uh, the array uh, held by T1, and at the same time, on another call, uh, T3 does the same. So T2 and T3 have a copy of uh, the array held by T1 that has been modified by themselves, and that they are the only one to own. Okay? No other thread can see the modification they've made. And then they decide to publish it. So they will begin, they will modify the pointer, and this operation is synchronized. So T1 will not see the modification because T1 is already iterating over this array. So it will continue to iterate on the old version of the, uh, of the array, and hopefully when it will reach the end of the array, it will free it, and this uh, version of the array will be garbage collected. The synchronization of the, the modification of the, of the pointer is synchronized. That means that if a thread T4 asks for the pointer to this array, it will see either the version copied by T2 or the version copied by T3. Maybe it will first see, maybe a thread T4 will see the version copied by T2 with the modification of T2. And maybe another thread, T10 or T20, will see the modification um, committed by T3. And this modification committed by T3 um, will, not, um, will not take into account the modification already made uh, by T2. So the modification made by T2 uh, have been erased, in fact. So th th this is not a good use case, but it is the way uh, the copy and write array list uh, works. So how can I do that on an hash table? If I can do it on an hash table, that means that I can do it on maps, on sets, on many structures of the uh, collection framework. So let's uh, spend a little time on that. So the, 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 the algorithm I'm going to, to present to you is called the, the tri-tree. It's a, quite a well-known al algorithm, and it works. It, it's easier to understand it with binary tree. So let's... let's uh, draw a binary tree, so those are uh, the eight first integer uh, written in binary. I guess everybody saw that. So I begin to, to create a pointer. I'll, I'll call it R, like root. And the root point pointer will point to two nodes of this binary tree. Every time I read a O, a zero, sorry, I go left, and every time I read a one, I go right. So this is the case here. So if I want to place O2 in this tree, I will first go to the right, then to the left, it's O2. And for O3, first go to the right, then go again to the right, that's O3. And once again, and once again I advance in the, in the building of this tree, um, it, it will go deeper and deeper, but it will never uh, grow uh, under the, the first zero uh, branch. So here is uh, 06. You can read the value of 06 just by reading 110 uh, in that tree. And now that tree can be used as a hash table, and a very efficient hash table, by the way. I can do a get one and put a pointer in 01 to an object. Okay, get one. One is uh, just one in binary, so I can read very uh, quickly uh, the position of 01 in this uh, binary tree. I can do the same for two which is one zero in binary, so I can uh, uh, find O2 very quickly too. And now this hash table, now that I have a hash table with, with this implementation, this hash table, I want to, to do it immutable, okay? It's an immutable hash table, so I don't have the right to modify it. 
So the question is the same. I, how can I update it? For instance, update 4. So I need to change the value of the pointer 04 to another value, O prime 4. And since I'm not um, able to modify uh, 04, okay, I'll make a, a copy of this node and put it uh, just uh, aside from 04. So if I um, uh, copy 04, I need, I need to do the same with 02 because I can change O2. So O prime 2 will point to O2, um, sorry, there's a mistake here. It should point to O5 and not O4 and to the new value of uh, O prime 4. The same goes for O1. We should point to O3 and not O2, sorry. <laughs> a second mistake. Uh, and point to the old value of O prime 2. And up to, uh, to the root of the tree. Then I have two trees uh, in front of me, one pointed by R, which is the white one, and one pointed by R prime, prime uh, which is the mix of uh, yellow and the white one. And if I want to uh, change from one tree to another, I can do exactly the same as the, the array uh, that I had a few minutes ago. I just have to synchronize the change of a pointer, which is a very fast operation, and here I go. The, follow, the, um, the union use node will be, will be taken care of by the garbage collector and everything will be okay. Now if I count, if I do a little math, how many operations do I need to duplicate such a tree? Well, the operation I need is only three. It's the depth of the tree. So it's log two of n, n is the number of uh, nodes in the tree. And two is the depth of the tree. In fact, it's the number of uh, child of children a given node can have. In a binary tree, a node can have two children, so it's log two. And this is very efficient to, to look at that because uh, if I want to increase the capacity of my tree, what I want to do, what I want to do is, is uh, increase the number of children per node. I don't want to increase the depth because th th this, is, this will uh, rule uh, how long it takes to find an element in my tree. If I take uh, um, 32 branches per node with a depth of 3, I can hold, my tree will hold 32,000 elements. And if I go to depth 4, it's 1 million elements. And the modification of such an immutable hash table of 1 million elements will take only four operations. So that's very fast. That's very, a very efficient algorithm. By the way, this algorithm has been uh, used in Clojure, which is a, um, a, um, a language on the, GVM, uh, on the JVM. And I've won on that, on that point. I've got immutable arrays. I can build easily immutable linked list. I think you can imagine that. I have immutable hash tables, so I have all the immutable structures I need to implement a fully immutable uh, collection framework. So immutable systems are a viable way of building concurrent systems. I can do, I can do it because I have all the tools I need on my hands to do that. <coughs> Since all the modifications are, are just um, kept on very precise parts of my code, all the rest of the, of, the, of the running of my application will be without any kind of volatility or synchronization. So it will be very efficient, it will be very fast. And this is the case for uh, implementation in Clojure, for instance. How can I synchronize operation without using synchronized operation? Now this may be a bit tricky, but there are indeed solutions, at least two. We're going to see, to see them. The first one is the, called the STM, and it deals with transactions in memory. If I write such a, such a code, begin, update, set, blah, 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 where, whatever, commit, well, this is SQL. Databases have been able to, to handle a concurrency with a, a transaction for years now. And that maybe, maybe it's a bit tricky for them, but uh, it's very easy to use. What happened on a commit? If the commit is successful, well, we continue. If it's a failure, we roll back. 
and we can try again. And for the same price in the database, I have uh, isolation, which could be taken for visibility, uh, rules that are very precise. And it works very well. So could we be able to take this concept and make this concept available in the Java code, in the, Java, in, in the memory uh, handled by the JVM? Well, the answer is yes, again, and this idea is not new. It's a, it has been around since uh, 1986, and the first implementation, 1995. There are several implementations around. Um, the one we are going to see uh, together is uh, the ACA uh, implementation. The ACA framework is uh, best known uh, for uh, its actor pattern uh, implementation. And there's a, uh, another implementation in Clojure that we, we just talked about Clojure a few, few seconds ago, and, uh, and in Scala. I guess you already heard about Scala. So here are the dependency you need uh, in Maven uh, with the repository. <coughs> if you want to, to play with the ACA 1.3, it's not the last version of ACA. There are, there have been uh, other releases uh, since that one. How does it work? First, I need to build a reference to wrap, in fact, the, the object I want to modify uh, in, a, in a special ACA object called the ref. And to uh, implement this, um, this, uh, sorry, this uh, transaction, I need to create an instance of Atomic. Atomic is, it looks like a callable, in fact. Okay, there's just an, uh, um, a method that I, uh, that I need to implement called atomically. And inside the atomically, I will uh, work on my wrapped object, the source, and swap the value of this object from a given value to uh, the new value. You'll see that this, the, this pattern looks like the atomic integer pattern. It's, it's a kind of casing, it's a compare and swap stuff. Okay, and in fact, it, it does work the same. So all the block here in red is the, the block put in the transaction, executed in the transaction, and the atom.execute is executed in the current thread. It doesn't have to be like that, it could be different. <clears throat> if a transaction fail, because the expected value was not uh, the one I thought, then the transaction is rolled back, and the code is executed again. So it's the exact same thing as the increment and get a pattern with the atomic integer a few minutes ago. So it may lead to some kind of high CPU uh, use in the case of high concurrency. It's different from the, the synchronized uh, pattern. What, what's nice with this kind of approach is, the, is that in, in this block, uh, that is automatically executed, I can do more than just sim the simple incrementation of a, of a counter or a, a simple modification of a variable. In fact, I can do complex things and I can do them atomically, just like in a database. And if they are rolled back, they will be rolled back as a whole, which is not possible if I just have uh, synchronized and, uh, and locks and things like that uh, on my hands. For instance, Let's take a very simple case that I can't handle with synchronized block. Take an object from a queue, from a waiting list, removing from this waiting list and putting, in, putting it in another waiting list. Okay, so I've got two waiting lists. And, and if the removing or the adding fails, then I want the whole to fail. So I, I want to roll back the whole operation. So here is I can do it um, with the, the ACA implementation. First, I, I need two wrappers on the two a waiting list called Q1 and Q2. Then I put that in an uh, atomically uh, method. First, I need to duplicate those lists. It's the exact same pattern as the copy and write array list. Before working on an immutable structure that I want to modify, I need to duplicate it. The approach is, the, is, the, is exactly the same. So I've got those two a copy of, the, of my queue, dubq1, dubq2. I transfer the element, and this transfer is made on the copies of the list, and I am the only one thread uh, to know the copies of, this, of those lists. So the rollback will be very, very easy to do. If, if the operation uh, is a failure, then all I have to do is throw away those lists, those references, and that's all. 
Then I swap. Well, I, I move my element from one queue to the other. Then all I need to do is to swap the reference of the uh, old queue to the new one, uh, both on the reference of ref queue one and ref queue two. And if it fails, all I have to roll back is roll back those two pointers, and that's all. This is a very, very smart way of doing things, I think. So here's basically how the uh, software transactional memory work. Now there are several implementations of them, and, and you, you need to, to, uh, to, to, to be aware of what happens under the hood a little. First, there are several, some of those implementations uh, use locks, and some don't. And this is a bit of a problem because if they don't use lock, how can they guarantee uh, memory integrity? Because we saw that the use of locks and the use of synchronized and volatile reads and writes is what is written in the JLS. And it, it, is, what, uh, it is that that will trigger the use of memory barriers. So if I don't use memory barriers, I can, how can I guarantee the integrity of my memory and the visibility of my variable? Personally, I don't know, <laughs> really. And there is a second uh, thing that you need to be aware of, is the amount of memory consumed by the number of active transactions. A transaction is not a, a free structure. It consumes memory. Locks don't consume memory, but transactions do. And in some implementation, the, the amount of memory used by the, um, the framework increases with the square of the, of the number of transactions. And believe me, you absolutely want to stay away of that because it will not work in production. The, co the memory consumption is, is much, much too high. So you need to be aware of that and you need to be sure that the implementation you are going to use uh, is the right one. You see that those software transactional memories, um, memory patterns, sorry, uh, is not free to use. So the question is, why is it so important? Why are, are we talking about that here? Well, because uh, this year, Intel, with, Intel the, 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 of course, the microprocessor manufacturer, will release a new uh, microchip architecture called Haswell, called Haswell. And in the Haswell architecture, there will be a new set of assembly instructions called the TSX, Transactional Synchronization Extension. It's a set of several assembly instructions that will implement STM inside the processor. So the memory of the processor itself is going to become transactional. Well, it can become transactional. And we have several stuff very important uh, uh, to, to handle that. First, the memory is not visible from other thread. A thread is working in a transaction on a certain piece of memory. This memory is seen only by that thread, which is very important in transaction, of course, it's the isolation the eye of the ACID stuff uh, from the, the dat database. And once the, the, the operations are committed to the, to the memory, the memory is published instantaneously and atomically uh, to the other thread. There's no, uh, I can see the first half of the memory and can't see the second half yet. No, th this is not supposed to happen. So this is really something that is, is going to be a, um, a real leap to, toward the, the, the use of, of STM. Now, if it happens in the CPU, will it happen in the Java language? Well, a, a, a computer science language is about exposing what the CPU can do, doesn't it? Okay, so the answer is yes, it is going to be uh, visible in the Java language. Not now, not next year, but probably in the years to come. There have been a paper published uh, back in June, June 2012, about uh, STM. It's uh, JAP, JAP are uh, um, stuff that are published in the OpenJDK uh, site. As you can see, I just made a, a copy of the screen. It has been signed by Doug Lee and Brian Goetz, so I think we can believe what has been written in this publication. And what does it say? It says better support, well this JAPE 155 is about better support for software transactional memory frameworks and possible future further additions uh, include addition in, uh, additional lock and future classes, reconsideration of related support that better enables construction of STM frameworks. 
However, STM suppose per C is not a goal for JDK8. So it's not for JDK8, okay? Probably we already knew that. But it might come to future version of, JD, of the JDK. So the STM is something that is coming. And this is, uh, in my humble opinion, a good reason to, uh, to look at it carefully. Actors. Actors are our second uh, ways of doing synchronization without synchronization. <coughs> the idea of the, of the actors is not a new idea neither. It comes from uh, 1973. Basically, an actor is a very simple entity. It, it's an entity that processes data. It gets, it gets a data message from the outside. And this message is immutable. The actor is not allowed to modify uh, this data. It might compute a result or not. And if it's the case, it just returns the result as an immutable uh, message too. And inside an actor, there's no concurrency. So if there's no concurrency, there's no need for any kind of synchronization. There are several implementation uh, of actors. One of uh, the, the one you probably heard before is, uh, is ACA. ACA, by the way, is written in Scala. There is a, there is a language called Erlang. Maybe some of you have heard of it. And uh, the entire uh, concurrency um, Handling in, uh, in Erlang is based on the, on the actor model. And there are other uh, Java or JVM APIs in Clojure, once again, and in Scala, once again, you have also uh, implementation of actors. <coughs> so how does ACA uh, actor work? Well, first, it's a framework that works with the thread pool. Uh, given application, uh, can create some actor, some actors, sorry, in the thread pool uh, and uh, send messages to them. Aka will then take a message, know that this message has been uh, has to be processed by a given actor, and this message is going to be processed in its own thread, and not two thread can execute a given actor at a given time. So at no time there's a need for synchronization inside uh, an actor. <clears throat> an actor may have a state, and we're going to see example with actors of actors with a state. There's no problem with that. But this state is completely inside this, uh, the, the given actor. It can't be shared between more than one actor. Well, it can't be shared among actors, uh, not shared to, to anyone. So there's no memory barriers included in that. No synchronization, no volatility, no memory barrier. Okay, let's create an actor. An actor in ACA is, uh, so it's the same version as the, the previous one, the uh, version of ACA. An actor basically extends the untyped uh, actor. It has a method on received, on received, sorry, uh, which takes an object as a parameter. This object is the message, of course. This object will be processed inside the on received method. An actor doesn't return uh, in a classical sense, but in, instead of returning something, it just called a get context dot reply uh, something. But it basically, uh, from, the, from the pure conceptual point of view, it's basically the same kind of thing that uh, uh, to return a, a value. How can I launch an actor? Pretty easy. I create a message, create an actor ref, Jeff, create a future, and I send this message to the actor, get back a future immediately. And I can call the get method of that future to get the result. Now, this future is not the future of Java util concurrent. It's an ACA future. So you need to be careful if you uh, use this code somewhere. But, uh, well, if you, if you mess up the, the different implementation of futures, you'll, <laughs> you'll soon realize because it won't compile, of course. So you, you get th this future is just a bridge between the threads. And you get to the, the result um, that you're looking for. Um, by calling the, this get method. Let's compare the execution of a given computation with the executor service um, framework from uh, Java 5, JDK 5, and the actor's pattern. On a quite a heavy computation, the prime factor decomposition of factorial 4000. A factorial 4000 is really a big number, so there are a lot of uh, prime factors in it. 
Here's the code of the actor. The, so the, basically, this decomposition will be uh, divided into slices from 1 to 10, 10 to 20, etc., uh, until the 4,000s. <clears throat> so the message will just hold the bounds of uh, the computation. It has to be decoded uh, in the actor. It's the code here. Where's my leader? Okay, it's the code here. The prime factors is the, is the class that uh, is able to compute the prime factors. Don't worry about uh, how it works. And here is the, the for loop. Sorry, here is the for loop that will do the computation. Then I return the result in the object PFS. The callable is not much different from the actor, in fact. Uh, the message that, uh, that is sent to the callable is, is sent through this constructor. It doesn't have to be decoded because I'm free to send whatever object I need uh, in that constructor. So, deb okay, debut means uh, begin <laughs> in French. Enfin means end. I'm sorry. I didn't translate those. Um, and uh, the, the implementation of callable works with the method call. We already saw that. And basically, in this method call, I have the exact same code as in the, in the, in the on-receive call. It's the exact same code. On the callable, I return the PFS. And classically, I don't have this get context uh, to, to call. OK, it's just a detail. This is the main thing, so the, the main method uh, to call uh, the actor framework. So I need uh, an array of futures. It's the ICA futures, uh, as, uh, as I already uh, told you. I just loop uh, among all the slices of my arrays. Okay, so every actor will just compute from 0 to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, etc., until uh, reaching 4,000. I just have to invoke uh, this actor, send him the, the message. The message is just uh, compute the, the prime decomposition, the prime factor decomposition from, let's say, 50 to 60, and then get back the result. I need to shut down the actor's registry which is to, to, to write a, a cleaner code. And here's the pattern for the, for the uh, executor service. And you can see that the executor service, once again, is, is nearly the same. It's nearly the same kind of execution. I need a thread pool. Okay, new schedule thread pool executor. I put 10 threads in it. Then I need an array of futures. It's not the same implementation, but it's the same, same name for, the, for that class. Then I have this loop that will divide up my uh, 0 to 4,000 array into slices of 10. And then all I have to, wait, to do is to, to, to wait for the computation to be conducted and to call the get method and shut down the executor service. And that's all. So basically, the pattern using, for, for this computation, the pattern using actors and the pattern using callables, really, they, they really look the same. The result is this. Okay, I told you it was a big number. <clears throat> what is the, the CPU you use? Well, if you run that code on your, on your machine, and if it has more than one core, you'll see that the CPU you use is roughly the same, um, between 90% and, and 100%. And the performances are really nearly the same. On the, on the machine I made the, the test, it runs in 2.7 2, 2. 2, 2. Uh, seconds for the actors, and 2.3 seconds for the executor service. Is the difference really sig si of any significance? Well, I don't think so. I, I, I don't think so. I mean, I mean, the difference is really tiny. So the, you, you, you take the overhead of the, of the warming up of the, um, the executor service framework, of the actor's framework. So, so the, the, there's no miracle here. From a pure computing point of view, using actors and using callable, it really looks the same. The code is almost the same, and the result uh, uh, from a performance point of view, is also nearly the same. What I can do, and this is a really uh, a, ni a nice feature, is to mix up actors and transaction. It's the same framework. This is the reason I took the same framework uh, for those examples. And you can run actors uh, inside transactions. And this you can do, of course, in the, in the executor service pattern. Let's take a very classical example, bank transfer accounts. I guess no one ever worked on bank transfer account in this room. Okay, <laughs> so I need. <laughs> okay, 
Nice. So I need, um, I need four technical uh, beans, okay, Java beans, uh, POJOs, a balance, a deposit, and a withdrawal, and a get balance. Those are my actor messages. I will send the message, give me the balance. I will send the message, deposit that amount in this account, etc. I've got an actor, which is a bank account actor. I will have one actor per bank account. This actor will have a state, which is the amount of money there's on this bank account. This state is wrapped up in the ref, as I showed you a few minutes ago. And inside the method atomically, it's not the on receive method that I use, it's the atomically method I, I use here because the atomically method is going to be executed inside the transaction. I need to know what kind of message I just got. Is it a deposit, a withdrawal, or a get balance? And for each of it, I need to decode the message, the exact message, and to execute the business code I want to execute. So atomically executes itself in a transaction. If, this transa if I'm already in a transaction, I will keep the, trans the existing transaction. So there's not the notion of sub-transaction. So this swap, this balance of swap, which is the casing um, method uh, we, we just talked about a, f uh, a moment ago, is the, is the method that, we, um, that is executed in a transaction. Excuse me. If, uh, if, if one method, if, if my uh, atomically method uh, throws an exception, then all the transaction will fail and will be rolled back, of course. <clears throat> and this is uh, the, the, the last thing I need for, for the, the, this kind of application, the transfer application. Now, the transfer is a bit more tricky, more tricky than w what I, I just did, because it needs uh, a bank account that is the source of the transfer, another bank account that is the destination of the transfer. Those two banks' accounts are actors themselves. They have their own state, and I'm going to change it. And there is an amount. This, um, excuse me, this, this message is not going to be sent to the, to the same actor as, as the one uh, just before. It's, it's sent to another type of actor called a bank service. This bank service has no state. It's a stateless actor. And its only goal is to um, create a transaction and to call the two actors of the two bank accounts in, in this transaction. So I have uh, this method coordinates, well, just does what it, what it says. It has to coordinate several actors. It, it works with a technical object called the send to object that will handle several uh, actor calls. And those are my, I, my actor call. The send to method um, returns a send to object that, will, that I will add in this set. A set is a, is a piece of the collection that doesn't hold um, the order in which I put the, the objects in. And uh, this is what I need because I don't care if I first remove and then deposit. I can do, I can do the transfer in both uh, senses. And I create the actor calls here. Uh, one deposit and one, one withdrawal. So when I return uh, the unmodifiable set, uh, I will take that and uh, uh, execute the two operation in the transaction of the coordinate method. So what do we have? <coughs> As I told you, each bank account uh, is held by uh, one, uh, one actor. This actor has a state. The transfer uh, stuff is held by another actor uh, without a state. But since no, it's forbidden in the CAF framework for an actor to be executed by two different threads, I am sure that I have no concurrency in those actors. Those actors have state, but that state is never shared. And th since it is never shared, it doesn't have to be uh, synchronized or made volatile. By the way, there's an excellent book uh, on that point, which is here, that you can get. What, how does it work from the pure performance point of view? Well, it works well. It brings new functionality, but the, once again, there's no miracle. If the CPUs are well uh, used, uh, then I'm not going to be any faster to go any faster uh, than um, than the the, the, the the executor service framework or whatever. 
Let's talk about parallel computing. So far, we have taken. Uh, um, We've, sorry. So far, I told you about uh, multi-threaded computing. I would like to talk about parallel computing. What do I have on my hands uh, to do some parallel computing on the Java machine? Well, before GDK 7, I have barely nothing. I can do multi-thread computing, but not really what I call parallel computing. In Java 7, I've got a new framework called the fork join framework. And this fork join framework comes with another part of the, the API called the Parallel Arrays uh, Framework. Now this Parallel Array Framework has not been included in the JDK 7, but it's compatible with the JDK 6. And the Fork Joint Framework is included in the Parallel Arrays API. So if you want to go to use the framework stuff, uh, the Fork Joint stuff in JDK 6, you can, as long as you use the Parallel Array uh, API. And in J the JDK 8, I will have a new method called parallel, and we are going to uh, see how it will work. So things in the last two years and in, uh, in the next year to come are really going uh, are really developing very fast on that uh, on that point. What is the goal of all this? There's a very interesting um, video in InfoQ. You can uh, search it, uh, find it with Google by a man called Guy Steele, who explained that parallel stuff uh, has to be included in the languages and uh, in the APIs. Uh, what he says is perfectly true. I think he missed a point or two, or at least he didn't talk about them uh, in, his, uh, in his talk, because uh, processing collections in parallel or conducting algorithm in parallel is not that easy. Uh, going parallel is, uh, can, be, can be tricky and can, can lead to, to caveats that are not uh, really obvious to see uh, at first. So let's talk about the fork join uh, framework. What is the fork join about? The fork join is about processing big amounts of data in a parallel way. <clears throat> it's based on the notion of task. So what is the task? The task is a, just a, a big chunk of, of data you need to process. Uh, a, a task is, has, has code in it and uh, has some kind of intelligence in it. So if a task thinks that it's too big, then it can spawn several smaller subtasks, uh, either two or more. There's no, there's no limit to that. And once a task has spawned uh, subtasks, it can wait and join those subtasks in, a, in, a, in itself to um, take back the results, to, to, uh, to compute the results. So from the framework point of view, it's another thread pool. Okay, uh, before Java 5, uh, I didn't have any thread pools in my, in my toolbox, and I, I have at least three or four different way of building thread pools, so this is nice. Each thread is associated with a waiting list, and this waiting list is, is an array blocking queue. Tasks are put in those, in those waiting lists, in those queues, and then the subtasks that are spawned are also uh, put in those queues. And there's a trick, which is explained in the book by Brian Goetz that I showed you uh, at the beginning of this talk. When a thread is out of work, it can steal a task from another, thread from, from another waiting list and put it uh, in its own waiting list. So let's show that let's let's see that um, on the blackboard i've got three uh, workers those workers are threads in fact a task presumably a big task coming in it so this task is put in the waiting list suppose it's uh, it's put in w3 w3 is going to handle this task and this task decides itself that it's too big and that is going to uh, to spawn two subtasks, T1 and T2. This is the fork operation. T1 and T2 are going to be put in the same waiting list uh, as uh, T. And at some point of the algorithm, well, T is going to wait for T1 and T2 to generate their results. It will join them and give back the result to the, to the caller. This is the join operation, and this is the reason why we call this framework the fork join operation. Things are quite simple here. Okay, so T is blocked. 
because it is waiting for the result of T1 and T2. So there is this unpush operation that consists in taking a task and putting it at the end of the waiting list. Then W3 will take care of T1, will maybe will fork two other uh, subtasks, T11 and T12. At the same time, W2, who is out of job, will steal T2 from W3 to handle it uh, by itself. This is the work stealing um, step. <coughs> T11 and T12 are going to be put in W3. Then T2 is going to spawn uh, other subtasks. That will be put in W3. Some more unpush operation, some more work stealing operation, and you'll see that um, from now on the, the algorithm is going to run. Hopefully those tasks are going to stop spawning subtasks and do real work. And the algorithm will continue, carry on, and will uh, conduct its, its computation. From the code point of view, how does this work? Well, I have to build a fork joint pool like that. I will take the same, uh, the same example as um, with the, the actors on the executor service, the prime uh, factors um, finder, on the same number. All I have to do is, to, is build this task and submit this task to the pool and everything will be uh, will be okay, will work for me. Here is the uh, code of this actor. The difference with the, the, the code of the callable or the code of the actor, sorry, not the actor, this actor of this task, the difference with the callable or, or with the actor is that I have this code here that forks uh, my, my task <coughs> if, if the decision is, uh, is that it's too big. So here the subtask is sent to the pool. And the get method, which is the equivalent of the, of the join, by the way, I also have a join method, which uh, works almost the same, not exactly the, the difference in the, in the handling of, uh, of exceptions. It will block until the result uh, is given. How can I split a task? Uh, the javadoc uh, only uh, gives a few uh, hints about how to split a task. It says that uh, all the tasks on, uh, on that are effectively computed uh, should roughly take the same amount of time to be computed, and they should not be too big, and they should not be too small. Ah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so basic, basically, this is a task. Okay, it looks like a potato, but it's a task. So if it's too big, I divide it, divide it in two. This is the first strategy. Then I run the if too big twice on the, the, the subtasks and, and then divide it again if they are still too big. But that's four potato, but smaller. And then I can do that again four times later. Okay, it's exponential as you know. And at some time, well, I will do the work in the end, of course. I can use this too big method and divide my task in two, in two subtasks, but I can also make, make a for loop. If, if the too big method is something like if size superior to a given threshold, then I, maybe I can be smarter and I can do things like that. Take my task, uh, run a for loop on it, and, and uh, uh, make slices of it, and send all the slices in, in, one, in one bunch in the, in the waiting list. Uh, there won't be any more if too big call, but there will be many work stealing operation. But the work stealing operation works very well in the in the frame in in the in the fork join uh, pattern. So this is the first strategy. I divide my task by two. Start M. I, basically, I, I take a middle point in my in my array <coughs> of iteration. Two forks and two joints here. And the second strategy. Here, okay, this is my for loop, all my forks, and all my joints here. On the computation of the prime factors, the second strategy is 30% faster than the first one. So the, 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 the choice of a, of a strategy has a real impact on the overall performance of the, of the algorithm, of the computation. So you should really consider uh, that point if you use the, such, a, such a framework. 
What about the parallel arrays? Parallel arrays have been released uh, with, uh, at the same time as the JDK 7. It's not in the JDK 7, but it has been released at the same time, and it's available in JDK 6. What's the problem of, uh, yes, so what, what, um, what, what is it uh, from a technical point of view? It's a package, JSR 166Y dot star. Um, and it, it, it includes the, the frame, jo the, the, sorry, the fork jump pattern, the, the fork jump framework. So if you want to use the, from jo the fork jump framework, you can take this package and use it, use it in JDK 6 and it will work. If you use it in JDK 7, you have to be careful because you'll have, you'll end up with two fork join pool uh, classes, one in uh, the Java dot blah 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 uh, package and another one in this uh, JSR 166 uh, package. So let, let's go back one, one moment on the fork join pattern. So I have my, my uh, big uh, potato-like task uh, it's some, some kind of array of uh, 1,000 uh, uh, elements. I divided up in, uh, oh, sorry, 100. I divided up in 100 subtasks of 10 elements each, and I'm, and I'm joining the results uh, in the end. Now, suppose I want to work precisely on an array. What should I do? The Java doc tells me that the two tasks from the fork join should not share any variable should not have any synchronization point, should not have any volatile write, writes, reads, or whatever. So I need to duplicate at least portions of this array from the master tasks, from master tasks, sorry, to the uh, subtasks. This duplication will not take much time, I hope, but it will take some memory it will double the, the amount of memory I need to run this algorithm. And if I want to run on really huge arrays, which will take a lot of memory, it can be an issue. What I would like to do is the following. What I would like to do is something like the SIMD approach I had at the beginning of this talk. Each task only has a pointer on, a, on an array that is shared, but, but it's not really shared because I, I'm going to only work on the, on the 10 first, um, 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 on the beginning of the array, well, each task will work on, on its own portion of the array. And that's all, I don't want to duplicate the array. But the fork join can't do that. The fork join is not made to, to handle that. And this is where the parallel arrays can help me. What is the parallel array? How does it work? It works in three steps. First, I need to create a special kind of array, giving him a four joint pool, another one, fifth one. I define several operations on it. Those operations are not necessarily executed at the time I define them. And then I launch the, I launch the computation. So this is the creation of the parallel array. I've got a whole catalog of operation. This is the value generation operation. Okay, it will uh, put values in the array, basically. This is filtering. All, all I do is uh, I define a filter operation, give it, uh, apply it to the array, and the framework will uh, compute the result on all the array. This is the reduction operation. The reduction, filtering, sorry. Filtering takes an array, um, as a parameter, basically, and it generates another array with the, the, whose values, or the value of the array, are the ones that have passed the filter, basically. It's a very simple operation. Reduction is I take an array and I want to generate a number among all the, the values of the array. It can be a max, it can be a sum, an average, whatever. The operations need to be associative. Ah, this is a word, a word that comes back from all mathematical course memories. But its associativity of the, of the reduction operation is really important because if it doesn't, then the result will be completely a mess. I've got constant adding. It's a mapping. It's a mapping of the array. So I take all the values and I associate another value, a new value. And I also have an, another operation called the, the product, which is in fact the inner product between two arrays. 
Okay, so with all these operations, I'm not very far from the computation, for instance, of a, of a L2 norm, with all what I did here. The L2 norm is just, okay, the two lines of code with all the operations defined previously. So it's, it's quite easy. It's a bit technical. Well, well it's JDK6, so JDK6 is not JDK8. I don't have the lambdas yet. It will come soon, but, well, in JDK6, I don't have them yet. So it's a bit technical, but it's, it's still feasible, and it's very, very efficient. The, the problem is that, um, is that if I use this kind of approach, I can define operations that are buggy, like a non-associative reduction operation. It will compile, it will execute, it will generate a, ge a result that has, uh, that has no sense, but, but I, I will have absolutely have nothing to tell it. In, 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 uh, apart, apart from just the fact that I, I need to know that myself that this operation is not associative. What I really regret is that I don't have the support for matrix computation, so the, this, the, the array computation is limited to the one-dimensional arrays. I don't have support for the two-dimensional arrays. Okay, so then why this uh, parallel array stuff is not in the JDK? Well, this is a real question. We had an answer, in fact, uh, Dougley, who made this API, uh, answered that on, uh, in an interview uh, available on InfoQ. And basically what he said is that uh, maybe um, this API was not really ready for prime time. If you put something in a JDK, uh, it is there for forever. Uh, for instance, the, one can think about the date class or the locale class. Um, well, it's there. <laughs> <laughs> for best and the worst, all right? So we didn't want to integrate the parallel arrays in the JDK. But anyway, once I have Java 8, I will not need the parallel arrays anymore. And I will probably not need uh, the fork join pattern anymore, neither. Why? Because in the JDK, sorry, in the JDK 8, I will have this Lambda stuff, I guess you all heard about it, this one's maybe even here. And on the line of stuff, I'll be able to write this kind of code. Person is a collection. I can call map on that collection. Associate this mapping from a person P, I get the age. In red, this is the lambda extra expression. It could be written with, a, with an anonymous class, but it's precisely the, what I don't want to, to write, an, an, an anonymous class. And then a reduction. And this reduction will take a default value and will apply the max method from the integer class uh, on each um, on, on the on the result on the result of the of the mapping. So this is a, basically this is the same. This is the same as using the parallel arrays or the fork join pattern. It's exactly the same, but it's the, the difference is that it's much much more simple to write. And this is why we are going to in that direction with Java. I can filter too. This collection method filter take a lambda and copy this in a, in a new array list. It raises only a question. This person is a collection object. Well, I guess everybody knows the, 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 frame, the collection framework. Is, it has been around since 2002, Java 2. And I can tell you something. Last time I checked the collection interface, there was no map method in it. So what is going to happen? Are they going to change the collection interface? That would, inquire, that would require the, the recompilation of millions and billions of lines of code? Well, I guess they won't do that. They will change the collection framework, yes, but they also change the notion of interface in the Java, uh, the Java language. The new collection interface will, will look like that. I've got the method add at all, okay, the one I have now. And I have this method sort, or this method sort, map, filter, reduce, etc. that takes a lambda. Comparator will be uh, expressed as a lambda. And I will be able to put some code with, with the uh, signature of, uh, of this method in the interface. And this code will be written like that, default, collection, sort, comparator. 
So my interface is, will not be this kind of collection of signatures of methods anymore. Th there will be uh, signature, um, methods signatures in it, but there will also be some code that will be defaulted, de de defaultly uh, executed on the code of the method sort, for instance, that will allow the compatibility of the previous collection framework to the GDK8 collection framework. So it will work with no need for any kind of recompilation, and this is really great. This is what people wanted to do. And what do I have in this collection? I have this parallel method in it. Ah, at last. Now the Scala guys, if you go in another room, the Scala guy will tell you, ah, but this parallel method, we had it for years. <laughs> you Java <laughs> developers. Yes, we are Java developers, but now we have it, and we don't have to learn Scala to use it, which is a very good news <laughs> for everybody, I'm sure. Okay, so I have this parallel stuff, so my mapping and my reduction will be able to be executed in a parallel on my CPU. Just by calling this method, it will work like that, just as it used to work in, well, I still use, still works in Scala. This is great. How will, how will it work? Well, this parallel method will return an instance of a special interface. We already have it because the GDK, we already have previews of it, of course. This interface is called splitterable. It's an extension of iterable, that's, I guess you all know. And this iterable interface exposed essentially one method in several versions, a split method. And this split method is the, the exact same thing I just did it, with my fork join pattern. The difference is that I don't have to, to write lots of technical code, I just have to write the, the, the division strategy I showed you in, in, this, in, this, uh, in this implementation. So I just take this split variable, I just extend my collection, give the division strategy, put, put my lambda in it, called parallel, and it would work. No, no technical code to write. So this is great. This is really great. There's probably some kind of fork join pattern or parallel arrays working for me under the hood, but I don't see them. And it's a good news because it's a bit technical to write that code of the fork join pattern. So the conclusion on the, on the use of the lambda is that the lambda will offer the same functionality with a very light syntax. And this is, uh, this is basically the goal of the of the, um, <coughs> excuse me, of the of the lambdas, and I'm and I'm uh, reaching the the last point of my talk. I'd like to talk about algorithm because right now, so far, we've talked about CPUs, hardware architecture, about how the language works, about how the APIs works, about what things are going to to be in the next few years with the lambdas and with the STM. Let's talk about the, uh, the algorithm. Um, in last February, uh, Heinz Kabutz, maybe some of you uh, already saw Heinz Kabutz here, because uh, he, he often comes to DevOps, uh, challenged the readers uh, of his blog about the computation of a Fibonacci number. Now, the Fibonacci number is, uh, is very useful, especially to make uh, a heavy computation. So he challenged people to compute the Fibonacci number of in this, in this, one billion. And uh, this is a huge number. If, if you write that number in a, in, a, in a text file, this text file will, will be about uh, uh, 200 megabytes. Okay, so it's a big number. And he said, okay, the record is uh, 5,600 seconds on the eight cores uh, Intel CPU. Right? So people uh, began to work. So this is the Fibonacci number, by the way. Okay. First improvement, 3,300 seconds on a four calls CPU. Okay, nice. Second improvement, 51 seconds on a one call with no parallelization. How is it possible? How such a thing is possible? Well, the guy that did that explained. First, he used the GNU JMP, which stands for Multiple Precision Arithmetics, 
Live instead of the JDK. Okay. Second, instead of taking the JDK big integer implementation, it took another one. Uh, the fact is the big integer implementation in the JDK is, uh, is not very nice, but it's here, like a date, like locale, and some other stuff. Um, the mul I think it's the multiplication uses an algorithm that increases in the square of n, where n is the number of digits of um, the number you want to multiply. And there's another algorithm with um, the complexity of n log, the, n log of n. Now log of 1000 is 3, so you have to compare 3000 with 1 million. Okay, you count to 1 million and I count to 3000 and the first one uh, to reach the, the, the end of it um, wins a cup of coffee. So I think I'll have the cup of coffee. It's much more efficient to, to, to conduct a computation in n log, the n, n log of n, sorry, instead of uh, n square. Three, he used a more efficient way of computing the Fibonacci numbers. The, the, um, the, the method I just showed you is, uh, is horrible. You should not use it, <coughs> even if it's the one you find everywhere on the web. And fourth, he replaced the recursive algorithm uh, with a direct computation. And of course, since there are no um, recursivity, it usually leads to faster implementation. The question is, what does it have to do with parallelization? Well, the answer is simple. It doesn't have anything to do with parallelization. It has to do with algorithm optimization. And this is the core of it. Between 1990 and 2005, linear optimization, forget about what it is, became 43 million times faster. Among this factor, 1,000 is due to faster computers. 40, the factor 43,000 is due to better algorithms. So the, so the, con the conclusion of this, of this story is, before trying to go parallel, be sure that the implementation you use, the algorithm you use, is the right one. Because may maybe you are going to, to earn to, to, to save a much bigger amount of time by using the right algorithm that trying to parallelize uh, an algorithm that is not efficient. <clears throat> For instance, the quick sort algorithm. I guess everybody knows the quick sort algorithm. It's the, the algorithm that is able to sort arrays of, uh, of data. The quick sort algorithm doesn't parallelize very well. First, you have to, to, to move the arrays from one core to, an, to another. So you, you pay the price of moving data around between the cache, the caches. And second, once you have all the subarrays sorted, you need to merge them. And the merge sort has a cost too. It has the cost to move the data around once more. And it also has the cost to execute himself, itself. Plus, the merge sort algorithm needs memory. If you're smart, you will only need 50% more memory than the original array. And if you're less smart, you will need 100% more memory than the original arrays. So you, you pay the price of moving data around, you pay the price of merging them, you pay the price of synchronizing things, and in the end, you're not, you, you're not sure to go, fa to, to go any faster. And, and if the memory is an issue in your, in your in your application, then you shouldn't try to prioritize the sort, the quick sort algorithm, it will be, because it will be much worse. Other algorithm, like the simulated annealing, that the simulated annealing, maybe you've never heard about that, is the algorithm that is, uh, is able to solve the traveling salesman project, uh, problem. Traveling salesman problem is a NP-complete problem, and there's the simulated algorithm. Uh, annealing is able to, to solve it very quickly. Uh, the simulated algorithm uh, uh, cannot be parallelized. Why? Because if it works, uh, it, uh, well, the working of this algorithm relies on uh, several uh, theorems that ensure that the, the, the convergence of this algorithm is effectively uh, the, the global minimum of the, of, of the function, uh, namely the, the, shortest, the, the shortest travels uh, among the cities of the traveling salesman problem. 
but you can't parallelize you can't parallelize this algorithm of course you can program it it basically works on an array so you can take this array split it run the algorithm on the, on the subtasks put put that on the full join that's easy <coughs> parallel arrays you can't but full join you can or even in a callable in an executor service but at the end of it, the, the, the result that will, will be computed is, is completely a mess. It's, it's a nonsense. It's not a result. It doesn't work. So you have to be extra careful with, the, with this algorithm. And I've reached the conclusion of my talk. I think that we are living a very interesting period of time uh, in computer science. Uh, in fact, probably a period of time that only happens every 20 years. In 1975, the C language uh, was released, and it was a revolution because you didn't have to, to handle the stack by hand anymore. I guess this was really great for people at that time. In 1995, the Java language uh, arrived, and there was no need to handle the memory by hand uh, anymore, which was really great. Maybe some of you remember the free and the malloc stuff, but really having to to forget about that was really a great relief. And in 2013, it's still the Java language, we will not have to deal with the multicore anymore. We won't have to handle the multicore by hand anymore. That means that the CPU itself is becoming a resource, as the memory is, handled directly by the JVM. So the, I will be able to program application in a parallel way, in a transparent way, and it will be quite elegant as well. But because the memory is not the CPU, the status of the CPU is not the same as the status of the memory, we'll have to avoid new traps, a new kind of bugs, not, not bugs in the code, because the code will compile, the JVM will execute that code, and it will work just like that but the one that comes from the algorithms. And this is really a new challenge and also a new opportunity for us Java developers. Thank you for your attention. <clears throat> this is great, we we'll still have uh, some time, so uh, maybe we can go through a question and answer uh, session. I, I, I don't know, are there microphones around? In the in the audience, I can't really see. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, please. Ah, the question is when Java 8 will be available on Android. Answer is I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> I have no idea. I'm sorry. Any other questions? Okay, so I think we can we can call it a conference. Thank you.